Morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining me in this session today. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's FrostCon. I certainly did, um, especially social event, having nice weather out there is always a good start. Um, yeah, my name is Lenz. Um, as you can probably tell from the green of the slide decks, I work for Susan. Actually, this is my second time I'm working for Susan, which is a funny story. If you want to hear more about it, um, feel free to get in touch with me about this. Uh, topic of this talk is basically kind of a continuation of previous talks that I've been giving at um, Frostcom before. Um, my Myself and the team that I'm working with, we are currently involved in the upstream Ceph storage project and we are working on a, on a web-based tool, what we call the Ceph dashboard, that allows you to configure, manage and, and monitor a Ceph cluster. Um, previously, we have been working on a project called OpenAttic um, that was also a tool to manage Ceph, but it was maintained out of tree as a separate open source project. So I'm going to start with a bit of a history where we're coming from and then giving you um, an update on, on where the project is currently heading um, and what it looks like. If the demo gods are kind with me, I hope I can show at least a, a small demo. It's running in a dev environment on my laptop, so it's not really that exciting, um, but at least it should give you an initial impression. I would like to start with a question. Who of you has never heard of Ceph and has not, no idea what this is about? You? Okay. <laughs> so maybe I, I will do a, a very broad overview um, to, to get you an impression. So Ceph's job is storing data. It's uh, a number of services that you can install on ideally a huge number of nodes in your cluster, so it's definitely not a single node system. Um, and it does some clever ways in how it makes sure that the data is evenly distributed among the node in that cluster. It ensures availability, um, redundancy, and all of these things um, by using some very elaborate algorithms that also make sure that Ceph scales very effectively across a large number of nodes. Um, it does so by dedicating the kind of the logic that determines where the data is being placed from what many clusters, storage systems usually use a, a directory service for to the clients themselves. Um, so the clients have a, a mathematical way, I would say, it's called the crush map that allows the client to compute which node in the cluster it needs to talk to to store the data. <clears throat> so that makes it very scalable, also very fault tolerant. Um, one of the key aspects of Ceph is that it wants to preserve um, the consistency of the data. And it actually does so by sacrificing the availability. So if Ceph comes into a state where it can no longer ensure that your data is, um, can be properly and securely stored, your client may actually block. So that's something to be aware about. It's not eventually consistent in the way that it just takes your data, tells you, yeah, it's all fine, and then deals with it. Um, the, the OSDs, which are the storage demons, they write out the data and then they give the client the okay that the data is securely stored. So Ceph basically just takes care of distributing objects um, on all of these nodes and it then has a number of services that support more um, common protocols to make that data accessible. By default it ships um, a Ceph block device, RBD, which you basically can uh, map on, on a Linux box as, well, an iSCSI target or a regular block device that, that just looks and feels like a disk, but the data is distributed and stored in, into your cluster. <coughs> Another way of storing the data would be the CephFS file system, where you simply just mount a file system similar to an NFS share, put data into it, it's a POSIX file system, and the, in, in the background, the CephFS data is again distributed and stored into, in the Ceph cluster. Um, last but not least, we have a more traditional object storage um, interface, which is the so-called RADOS gateway, RGW. It supports both the S3 and the Swift protocol from the OpenStack project. So if you have an application that is capable of talking this protocol, you can also use Ceph as your storage backend for your data. Mm. Yeah, that should be sufficient to give you an overview. 
if you have more specific questions or want to learn more about Ceph, um, Ceph.io is the website where you can learn more about this. This is a, a regular open source project. It originated um, in a company called Ink Tank that was later acquired by Red Hat. Um, nowadays, um, several companies, including SUSE, Red Hat, um, some canonical and others are working on that, as well as a, a growing community of users and developers. Ceph usually does uh, a new major release of the software every 9 to 12 months. The release cadence is, is somewhat changing at the moment. We are now looking in doing uh, yearly releases again instead of every nine months. And what I'm going to do is talk a bit about the evolution of this dashboard in the past three Ceph releases. <coughs> Let me just get in. Sorry. Um, and usually each Ceph release has a, a code name which um, relates to um, an octopus. So, um, yeah, the, the Ceph developers like octopuses in all forms, and so they're usually using names of certain kinds of octopuses to name them. <coughs> and the first version of Ceph that shipped um, with the dashboard was Luminous. That is um, August 2017, so it's already two years ago. But that was the first time when the Ceph project themselves included a web-based interface. Um, back then, really, it was just a dashboard. You can only obtain read-only information um, to just get um, a quick impression of how your cluster is doing. I have a screenshot here on how that looks like. So it was read-only. Um, it showed you the health status. You can take a look at the, the log files underneath the, the cluster log and the audit log. Um, see a list of nodes and the, the storage daemons. Uh, what else? iSCSI daemon status. So it was really a, a very simple page that you could bring up somewhere on, on a screen in the data center to get a quick glance on, on your Ceph cluster um, without going to the command line and running commands on top of that. Before that, Ceph was as many um, these kind of infrastructure projects, something that you always needed to use the command line to work with. And Ceph wasn't really famous for being very command line friendly. And well, just based on the complexity and that it's a distributed system, there certainly is a, a somewhat steep learning curve in getting started with it. Um, so that dashboard was really the first incarnation where users now had a web page that they can look at and, and, and get an an easy impression. Um, after Luminous was released, there was kind of a, a, a growing demand for adding more features to that because users liked having a web-based interface. Um, so pull requests were created in, in master for the next coming release. Um, lots of features were requested. But it was also somewhat clear that the existing dashboard wasn't really up for the task based on, on how it was developed. <coughs> so, um, that was the point at which the team working on the Open Attic project approached the Ceph up upstream community um, if they would be interested in, in collaborating with that. Because the, the Open Attic project had made, well, we have been working on, on our standalone tool for several years already, added quite a number of Ceph-related management features, so we had somewhat of an idea of how this could work, and we were proposing if we could simply um, take our work and yeah, take the, the experiences that we've made into a new dashboard. So we, we were not planning on taking OpenAttic and just porting it upstream, because in, in the way OpenAttic was designed from an architecture perspective, that wouldn't have been easily doable anyway. Um, and, and we then came to an agreement to start jointly on, on kind of enhancing the existing dashboard and, and making it more feature-rich and, and uh, more scalable in a way as well. So that's when we started. That has been about one and a half years ago by now. Early in 2018, the work started. And we first made kind of a proof-of-concept prototype that um, was taking the original dashboard, the V1 version, but converted it to uh, a new 
backend and frontend infrastructure and architecture, just to show what would be possible. Mm. But that proof of concept was never really merged into the master branch. So I think the branch is still around, but we just did it for demo purposes to see what is possible um, and to, to yeah, kind of demo what, what we are capable of doing with this new framework. And then we started going ahead. Dashboard V2 was started and it was first available in its first incarnation in the Mimic release, which, which was um, published in June 2018, if I remember correctly. Um, one of the premises of, of getting there was, or uh, one of the requirements, I would rather say, was what we wanted to be able to have all the functionality that the old V1 dashboard provided. Uh, we also collected all of the pull requests that had been submitted against the old dashboard and, and added this or ported it to the new architecture of, of the dashboard V2, as we back then called it. And, and for a time, both the, the old version and the version under development were both in, in the same re Git repository, and you could switch between them during the development cycle. But shortly before Mimic was released, we made a hard switch and moved the code around, so the new dashboard V2 became the new default in a way. And again, I have a a screenshot. So it still somewhat resembles V1, but um, if you are or have been familiar with OpenAtic, you could also see that we have taken some inspiration of the UI from there. So it's, it's somewhat of a blend between those tools. Um, but it was really something that we started mostly from scratch. So both the, the backend architecture changed. Um, we moved to CherryPy, so it's Python-based. Um, we created our own RESTful API, own controllers and everything. Um, the web UI was designed uh, from scratch using Angular, TypeScript and Bootstrap, so very popular and, and common web frameworks. Um, and as I said, um, somewhat derived the look and feel from the open attic UI there. Since we were also adding management functionality, that was not just display or visualizing things, we also made sure that access control is provided. So we had to add a, a very, well, back then it was a very simple access control system. There was just a single user account um, that you can freely define both the username and password that you needed to enter in order to access the dashboard. So that was about it. But at least there was some level of protection to prevent um, unauthorized users to make changes to your Ceph cluster. Because we were now exchanging this kind of, of um, yeah, security-relevant information, we also needed to add encryption. The previous dashboard didn't have support for SSL, for example. It was just plain HTTP. Um, and, yep, the milestone was that all of the features from Dashboard V1 were actually included. But in addition to that, we had already started um, porting over functionality that OpenAtic provided. The things that we started with was um, the block device management, so everything related to RBD block devices, um, as well as the S3 compatible object store management, RGW. So you were able to create new users, obtain their access keys, take a look at their buckets, and just those general um, management functionality was added. Something that was also added in Ceph Mimic was a new way of how the Ceph cluster um, is supposed to be configured. So in, in the early days, there was a file called the ceph.conf file, where you made all the config options that um, Ceph needed to um, adhere to. And that file then needed to be distributed across all nodes of your cluster using Salt, Ansible, whatever, but it, it, it was very important for Ceph that the config file was the same on all of your nodes, which was a bit cumbersome. Um, so with that version, they moved the majority of the configuration, these key value settings, into Ceph itself. Um, so the mons, which are the nodes that kind of keep track of how the cluster is doing, they have their own way of sharing. Um, information and data, and it also included uh, a database, a key value store, basically, and that one was extended to also store 
all these various config settings. And the dashboard provided, um, in that version, a read-only view into the config settings. So you could query them, um, take a look at their default values, if they have been modified from their defaults, and so on. Um, yeah, so that was Mimic. And that's when we also noticed quite an uptake in, in activity. So something that, as the Open Attic standalone project, we always have been somewhat suffering from was that we were out of tree and any change within Ceph was something that we always had to kind of run afterwards. So we were always, or we had to be very careful if the upstream Ceph project made any changes that potentially broke our project and then we had to make um, adjustments and, and create new versions. So it, were, it was hard to, to stay in sync and, and being part of the upstream project and integrated in the test suite being in the same Git repo made this job much easier because we had our own set of tests that were run and it was based on this much easier to capture any regressions and make sure that if the developers made changes somewhere else in the Ceph code base that the dashboard could also easily be fixed and improved along the line, these lines. <coughs> so, yeah. Around that time, um, we had already some, some, uh, somewhat grown our developer community. So after the team at SUSE started that work, um, pretty shortly afterwards, engineers from Red Hat also joined that project and started contributing. Um, we had a meeting where we met in person to discuss roadmaps and, and our joint goals. So we identified the features that we wanted to work on for the next Ceph release. For the team at SUSE, one of the um, goals that we had was that we wanted to basically reach feature parity with everything that Open Attic provided. Um, since we didn't want to be stuck in a, in a mode of developing two tools in parallel for an infinite future, um, we really had the goal of making sure that Dashboard can at some point replace Open Attic without regressions, which we didn't reach in, in the Mimic release. Um, there was still a lot to be done. Um, but also, um, the folks from Red Hat had some of their ideas and requirements, so they started assigning engineers to these features. And we then really collaborated very closely over the course of the last year um, for what is now being released as the Nautilus release just recently. And that's also the version that I'm going to go over in the demo. But first, I would like to give you a quick update or, or kind of a laundry list of the features that we've implemented in the meanwhile. So Nautilus was uh, released earlier this year in March. And yeah, Dashboard was really mentioned as one of the key highlights of that release. Um, but of course, there were lots of other internal changes and enhancements. But lately, the Ceph project has been putting a lot of focus in enhancing the manageability and usability of of the cluster as a whole, making sure that command line utilities are more consistent, um, making the output more meaningful, more readable, things like that. So generally, in addition to, of course, enhancing performance, adding new features um, with the dashboard, usability, manageability was some of the topics that we were really keen on improving. So what did we add for Nautilus? Um, yeah. The, the initial version of the dashboard with a single user, single password was just, well, not adequate. So we now added a way to add multiple users and also be able to give them um, specific roles. So you could create a user, for example, that only manages RBD, or you could create a user that is read-only. So they can log in and they can see everything, but they are not about to make any changes like deleting RBDs, adding pools, or things like that. Um, so it's very flexible. So we have uh, a predefined set of roles, and you're free to add new roles based on, well, a very simple system similar to the Unix concept. You can add, um, I think, read, delete, um, write permissions. I can show you the, the metrics later on. So that makes it much more flexible and hopefully also more suitable for 
um, larger environments where you may have multiple self-administrators managing a cluster. Also, um, that's a requirement, especially in larger organizations, they usually don't want to maintain multiple pockets of user information, so um, most of them have an Active Directory, an LDAP or whatever, and the dashboard provides you a way to use um, an identity provider that supports the SAML v2 protocol. So you can configure the dashboard to basically offload the, the authentication part of the username and password to an external IDP, but unfortunately you still have to create the user account locally because of the roles and the, the permissions that the user has. But using the SSO, it's now possible for you to, for example, disable user centrally, and make sure that um, other requirements like um, two-factor authentication or things like that are being implemented. Auditing was added. Since the dashboard allows you to make changes to your cluster, it may be a good idea to keep track of who has been doing what and when. And since the dashboard has a both uh, the web UI and, and a backend that provides a REST API. We, we took an approach where the backend keeps track of this auditing information in a, a similar way to an Apache access log, where you, you get an entry for each API request, where it originates from with the user credentials and, and what particular action has been performed. Um, by the way, if you have any questions about what I'm saying, just raise your arm and I'm happy to address it right away. So um, just to make it a bit more interactive. If there are more detailed questions, of course, we have time at the end. Um, but usually, some, if something comes to your mind, just raise your arm. New landing page. So one of the things that was still looking like the old dashboard was the page that you so when you immediately logged in, so that overall status view of, of your whole cluster, that needed some improvement. So um, with Nautilus, we completely overhauled that page to make sure that it's, it's a bit more logically arranged and um, gives you really the key metrics and, and, and health information of your Ceph cluster at a glance. So the idea behind it is that this is a page that you can put on a screen in your data center and then you take a look at it and, um, well, see how your cluster is doing. And it, it's also a bit more um, live, so we added a lot of graphs that are updated um, in, a, in a very frequent basis, so it's continuously updating the, the cluster status. Internationalization was added. Um, that was one of the requirements that um, SUSE had, since as a European company we are addressing uh, a market with quite a lot of different languages and we um, added support for, well, yeah, the first thing that we had to do is actually make the dashboard code base translatable and the next step was creating a platform and infrastructure that allowed um, yeah, the community to add languages, but we also had a, a dedicated team of translators working on an initial batch of languages, which by now includes um, German, Portuguese, Chinese, Japan, Japanese, French, Brazilian, Portuguese, and I think four or five more languages. So it's, it's a lemma that's continuously growing. And in fact, <laughs> the day after we had set up the translation platform, Chinese was complete. I was completely in awe about that. We hadn't even, even properly announced it, um, but some member in the Ceph community was following that development and just went they had and added all the Chinese strings in no record time. That was really amazing. Um, so this is something that we update um, continuously. Every time a new language is more or less complete, then we will add it to the code base. And the REST API that is part of the backend um, received some love, so we now have um, added um, an open API specification based on Swagger. You can use your web browser to basically browse all API endpoints. Um, it's self-documenting in a way, so if, if you add comments to the REST API controllers in the Python backend code, it will also be rendered in, in the 
in this web view of the REST API, which hopefully makes it easier for developers to just um, not use the, the dashboard front end to perform tasks, but just talk to the back end if they want to, example, um, create a new pool, um, obtain certain information or whatever. The intention behind this is that at some point um, the, the dashboard's REST API becomes the de facto um, self-management API. So, new features. OSD management was very high on our list. So, we added some functionality to um, work with your storage demons, since these are kind of the workhorses of a Ceph cluster. Um, you need to take a, a special eye on how they are doing, how they are performing. Um, so, we now have a dedicated page for that. You can um, manage OSDs in the sense that you can mark them as down or out if you need to do maintenance on them. You can set various OSD-specific settings. Um, we've added something that is called recovery profiles, um, which basically gives you an easy way to select if your Ceph cluster should be um, focusing or increasing its priority on serving client load, or if it should spend more time in, in rebalancing data, for example. Now, that's something that's important if an OSD was taken out or if you've added new OSDs. Um, sometimes these kind of changes result in lots of, lots of internal data movement. So the OSDs talk with each other to share information and data, and you can have a, an easy way of, of prioritizing how much they spend time on that synchronization work versus serving a client load. Also, one of the things that we've taken over from um, the Open Attic project, um, we use Prometheus and Grafana for cal capturing and visualizing metrics and performance data of your entire Ceph cluster. And we, we basically embed those Grafana dashboards within the Ceph dashboard in various places. And we did so. Um, there was a, a separate project called Ceph Metrics that just provided the Grafana dashboards, but no further integration. And we worked with these developers in updating and converting those Grafana dashboards so they are easy to embed within the, the Ceph dashboard. The config settings viewer that I've spoken about earlier has now been converted to a config settings editor, which makes it a bit more useful, of course, because now you can not just look at the various config settings, but you can actually change them at runtime. Um, so basically, any, any feature, any tweak that you want to provide can be done through the dashboard. So if pool management was added, um, pools are basically yeah, the layer between the, the object storage demons and, and your, your client application. So a pool basically identifies, well, as the name applies, a pool of where your data is stored, and it, it could have um, certain availability and performance characteristics. So managing those pools is, is quite essential. So that has been added. Um, erasure code profile management, that's something that is maybe a bit too specific to explain in detail, but it basically determines on how the data in, within a pool is being replicated among the OSDs. Uh, but the mirroring configuration has been made easier now. Um, Ceph allows you to replicate block devices to another Ceph cluster in an asynchronous fashion using RBD mirroring. Setting this up on the command line is, can be complicated. We now have a, a web UI that guides you through the process of setting this up. And I already spoke about the Grafana dashboards. Um, so in, in most places of the Ceph dashboard, we usually have um, a Grafana dashboard that gives you an kind of an accumulated overview of all of your nodes. Um, like, for example, on the OSD page, you have a one Grafana dashboard that gives you an overall overview of all OSDs, plus for each OSD a more detailed Grafana dashboard for a metrics specific to that particular OSD. Okay, I need to speak up. Um, crush map viewer. So, as I said, the crush map is this kind of algorithm that determines how data in your Ceph cluster is being distributed. And this is just a viewer, so it gives you a, 
a graphic representation of kind of the hierarchy um, that you have identified. So Seth has a notion of setting up um, availability um, areas, I would call them. So, for example, you could tell Seth that it should ensure that the data is available um, on two racks or on two nodes or on two data centers if, for what have you. Um, and visualizing that is now possible within the dashboard as well. One of the way on how a CFFS file system can be made accessible to non-Linux clients is using NFS. Um, there's a, an independent project called NFS Ganesha that is a, a user-level NFS implementation that has quite a number of different backends, and one of them is CFFS. So the dashboard can now configure NFS shares based on both CFFS and also on S3 buckets. So even though it, it, the performance obviously sucks, um, but it is possible to create in Rados Gateway an S3 bucket and put an NFS share on top of it. But just thinking about all the various layers that data has to go through, um, you can imagine that this is not very fast. But it's sometimes an, an interesting way if you need to, let's say, do a, a bulk import of data. Let's say you have an application that used to store its data in a file system, but you want to migrate it to an object store. So being able to use regular Unix commands to copy that data over into an NFS share that has an S3 bucket underneath would be an, an interesting import option. iSCSI target management was added. So again, this is something to make Ceph more accessible to non-native Linux clients. Usually, if you are having um, a Linux client talking to your Ceph cluster, it would use RBD, block devices, natively to access block data. Um, but we now can put um, yeah, iSCSI targets on top, and, and then you can use basically any client that speaks the iSCSI protocol to access your RBD images. And yeah, automating and configuring those targets is now possible through the dashboard as well. We added support for managing, well, <laughs> QoS is, is what they call it, but it's more rate limiting, I would say. So basically, without this feature, a single RBD client can easily hog up lots of resources of your Ceph clusters without giving the other clients the same amount of, of, of speed. Um, so you are now able to perform setting up I.O. limits, like the number of IOPS or the amount of bandwidth that the client can consume. And that can be done either on a pool level or even down to an individual RBD level if you want to. We also added alert management from Prometheus. So basically, um, in addition to the metrics that we already collect, we have now added a number of um, default Prometheus alerts. So if you are running Prometheus and it's monitoring a Ceph cluster, it can now also trigger alerts to certain um, yeah, criteria that you define based on the defaults that we ship. <coughs> and the dashboard is now capable of visualizing those alerts within the dashboard, so you can see them directly without looking into your email or whatever notification system you have set up. Um, Self manager module management. That was a feature um, that was added a few versions ago already. So the self manager is basically a process that takes over some of the administrative tasks. So contrary to the monitors that kind of maintain health and state, the self manager takes care of, of yeah, collecting information. Um, yeah, it's. it's sending out instructions to the various nodes in a way. And, and it has a plugin system. The Ceph dashboard itself is a manager plugin, but there are quite a lot of other additional modules that have been created in the meanwhile. Um, since they are Python modules, it's very easy to create a Ceph manager module. And we have a, a growing number of these. So making them a bit more easy to enable and disable and, and configure them, we added um, support in the dashboard for doing that. And with that, I think I can hop into a quick live demo. And if there are any questions, yeah, as I said, just jump in. And I hope we maintain enough time in the end to 
look into this. Um, I'm going to quickly change my screen setup because I... Oh, this way it even might work. Let me just switch to the browser. I'm moving it over to the other screen. On. Can you see that? Okay. Let me increase the font size a bit. So now that's the start page. Um, maybe also worthwhile mentioning we, we, from the start on, made sure that the dashboard is very easy to customize and to change the branding because, well, both Reddit and Zuzu, for example, they do have their own products that are safe distributions and if they want to add their own look and feel, we wanted to make it easy for them to use their company-specific color schemes, for example, changing the logos and those kind of things. Um, so that's easily doable. This is the upstream branding on how it ships. Um, as you can see here, you can choose among a, a growing number of languages that you want to use the dashboard in. I'm going to stick to English just for the sake of this demo. And in this development environment, there's a default admin admin user. And no, I don't want to save that. Thank you. So this is the start page. I'm going to reduce the font size a bit so you can just see it in, in one glance. That's the what we call the landing page in which you can see how your Ceph cluster is doing. Um, so you see the overall health status, how your monitors are doing, which are the ones that take care that your cluster availability is, is proper. Um, of course, the OSDs, how much you have. Um, as I said, this is a laptop demo environment, so five OSDs is really the bare minimum of having Ceph up and running. So you, sh you wouldn't be starting something like that in production. Um, we have just one manager daemon running. Um, if you want the dashboard to be highly available, highly available, you would be thinking about creating more than one manager daemon. Um, so many environments have set up usually three managers, and all, at any time only one of them is the active manager, and this is where the dashboard would be running. If, if there would be a failover to another manager, you would just be redirected through the web browser to the currently active instance. Yeah, object gateways, hosts, yeah, well, it's just a single host, so not very exciting. It's also an idle cluster, so there's not much I.O. activity going on, um, since this is a, a very measly laptop and I don't have not lots of disk space. I made that mistake in a previous conference where I had some uh, demo workload going on where I was just reading and writing data to just get the, the widgets running and then during the demo it ran out of disk space and it, everything fell apart, so I'm not trying that again. Um, yeah, so this is really hopefully most of the relevant information at a glance. At some specific states you can dig deeper, so um, let's go to the hosts, for example. I could either click on hosts here or I would go to cluster hosts and I'm going to increase the font size again a bit. So if you would have more than one host, that table would be longer. Um, each table has a, a search form where you can easily and quickly drill down matching on specific parameters. And in here you see the host and what services are running on it, what version right now, well, that's the development version. And from here I could then see more specific information, performance metrics. I'm going to show these in a different screen. And well, here all, overall performance would be an example for one of the Grafana dashboards that we have, in which you get an aggregated view of the performance metrics of all hosts in your cluster. So that's something that Prometheus takes care of. So that's hosts. How are we doing time-wise? I need to make sure. Yep. The mons are another key component. So here you can see how your mons are doing, how many sessions they are running, how many of them are in quorum, which means that they are in agreement about the current health state of the cluster. That page still very much resembles the original dashboard. 
in version one. Um, we haven't really looked into how to enhance or improve this, but um, yeah, we are just seeing an uptake in the number of dashboard users, so I'm hopeful that they will provide us with feedback on how to enhance and improve those pages and if in some information is missing. Quickly moving on, OSD. So this is one of the pages that you likely will be spending more time on. Again, you can quickly filter that list by various criteria. Maybe if you just want to take a look at OSD on, on a single host, you can see their status, um, yeah, usage, those graphs here usually show I.O. activities and so on. Um, and you have a number of things that you can configure here. Cluster-wide configuration, for example, gives you a way. Um, let's say we don't once have to add an OSD back into the cluster once it has been marked as out, just to show you that this is actually working. Um, and as you can tell, Ceph immediately shows a yellow heart, so it's not happy anymore. Let me go back. Okay, I have a health warning here. And why is that the case? Because I just enabled the no in flag, which, well, can become a, a problem because, well, even though the OSD may be alive again, we are prohibiting from rejoining the cluster. So you may run into a degraded mode at some point. At this point, it's just a, a warning, nothing to worry about. Um, I'm just doing it to play around with it some more. Um, the recovery priority I spoke about, so basically, you here have a way to quickly make changes to the various settings that define the priority and how um, recovery activity is being prioritized over serving client load. And we have a number of yeah, default profiles that you can select from, but you can, of course, customize them if you have more specific needs. Um, according to the values that you have determined for your environment. So let me put it into low. Now I'm going to be nasty and I'm going to tell that OSD to go down. And yes, I'm sure about that. And after a short while, it should also be seen as down here waiting. That's the demo effect, or did I have to... Ah. Oh, it's fine. Okay. Interesting. That's maybe me doing something wrong because it's live, or we have found a bug. In any case, let me try something else. Let's mark it as out, that should work. Okay, there we go. So now going back to the status page, it should also tell me that one of my OSDs is out and no longer available. At this point, Ceph at some point should start shuffling data around. As you can see here, recovery throughput is now showing some activity. Um, you can also see here in this placement group status that there's some activity going on. Placement groups is kind of a way of how Ceph groups objects together and how it makes sure that they're evenly distributed among the, the OSDs. So with this OSD being down, it still has redundant copies of the data elsewhere. Now it's just trying to attempt to, again, re-establish the redundancy level that I've determined. So now it's moving data around to make that happen. And if you go, for example, to the Ceph pools list that we have here, you can now see which of your pools are being ex impacted by this um, and what, in what state the various placement groups of that particular pool are. I have to speed up a bit, so I don't think I can go through each of those tabs. Um, crush map might be interesting. Well, as everything is running on a single node and it's a very small cluster, that tree is not very big. Um, but you can collapse and expand various nodes here. And depending on your crush map, you may see uh, a more detailed hierarchy here. Clicking on one of these OSDs would then give you some more information. Thank you. 
Um, quickly going on images. If you agree, I'm going to spend maybe five more minutes on, on the demo and then we move to 10 minutes Q&A, just to give you some more of an impression. Um, let me quickly create a pool so you can see this. So one of the things that if you want to, for example, store RBD images in Ceph, you would create a pool usually named RBD. You could choose how the data should be distributed. could either be what is called erasure coding. Um, I'm using replication just to copy the data. Um, let's make it a bit smaller. We start with eight placement groups. And we store three copies, and the application of this pool is RBD. Thank you. I could enable compression. I could create quotas and so forth. I'm just going to mess with this at this point and just go with the defaults. Okay, so now my RBD pool is being created. And there we go. And now I can actually go into my block device list and create an image. So, so that's basically the, the process of creating a block device that you can then attach from another Linux client to store data on it. Um, again, there are lots of more things that you can play around with here. Due to a lack of time, I'm just going to gloss over these. Feel free to test them and, and toy around with them by yourself. So. There we go, RBD image has been created. Um, I didn't enable NFS, so that's something I can't show. I also didn't enable mirroring and iSCSI in this demo environment. Um, sorry. So file systems may be something quickly worthwhile looking into. So in this setup, there's one CFS file system. And if it would be mounted um, by clients, I would see the activity of these clients and, and how much I owe their performing, for example. RGW is the object gateway. Here I could see... Um, that's bizarre. Congratulations, you have found a bug. Um, yes, so object gateway refuses to work. That's interesting. Let me just reload the page and see if that helps. This is a snapshot from master two days ago, so it's not in a released version. So bugs can occur, and they do. Let's see if that helps. Nope, it doesn't. So in that case, oh, there we go. Yeah, all right, that's the point where the demo falls apart. I'm not going to tempt the demo gods any longer. I hope this gives you at least a brief and quick impression of what we have accomplished so far. I'm going to switch back to the demo, uh, to the presentation real quick for final words. And even that refuses to work. Brilliant. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. Crap. <laughs> so even though I have not been doing much I.O. or anything, it seems like my laptop is now very busy dealing with Ceph in the background and not giving my presentation any more priority. Okay, let's stop at this point before it gets more miserable. Um, roadmap, well, Ceph Octopus is underway already, so we are now working on more and new features. Um, there will be a focus on more user management related things like um, being able for users to refresh or have a password expiry, something that comes to mind at this moment. So several things related to user management and security, something we're going to add. The whole RADOS gateway, object gateway management functionality will be enhanced. So th these are some of the topics that um, we are spending some time on. I have pointers to our quote roadmap in the presentation that I'll be sharing. So even though it currently does not co um, collaborate with me anymore, you will be able to take a look at the slides offline later on. And with that, I think we have time, 10 minutes for questions. Sorry that this broke down a bit in the end. That's what happens when you do live demos. Yes, uh, <laughs> thank you, Lenz, uh, for the presentation. Are there questions? 
Yes, there's a question. Um, you mentioned the Grafana dashboards in the um, yeah in the web page. Or um, mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to import them to your own dashboard so um, you have it all in one place, or right. do you have to use the monitor? So the, the way that we're doing it is that we have a, a stock set of Grafana dashboards that are part of the Ceph distribution that are made specific in, in their design so they can be embedded by the Ceph dashboard. But since this is a, a standalone Grafana instance, you, are, you can actually contact to this Grafana instance directly. You can add more dashboards if you want to. But in that case, they wouldn't be visible within the Ceph dashboard unless you would modify explicitly those dashboards that we're embedding. That is possible as well, um, but by default we just have a set and, and, and they are being visible, but you are free to add more if you want to. Yes, thank you. Are there more questions? Okay. Doesn't seem so. There's one. Ah, there's one. Oh, sorry. Give an example of where it's being used and uh, some war stories or something like about it. Uh, so illuminate the background a little bit. Could you repeat the first part of the question? Uh, war stories about what? I, uh, need not be war stories, but uh, where it is being used from practical, uh, from, from a practical, uh, where right. it's being from so actual. Why a dashboard uh, at all? No, no, yes. <laughs> I, I think it's uh, in your customers, it's already used somewhere. And give us some examples mm. of where it's so, beneficial. Um, the, even though the dashboard has been introduced in, in Mimic, um, now with the Nautilus release, it's really the first version where it will be productized in, in downstream products. So both SUSE and Red Hat are, well, SUSE has just released their downstream product based on Nautilus. Red Hat is still working on it. But we are now just starting to roll this out too. SUSE customers, to speak as a SUSE representative. Um, but there are a number of reports on the Ceph users mailing list of people using it, looking into it. Um, the people working on Rook, making sure that um, Ceph runs into containers, are looking into this and, and, and enabling it by default. Um, it's, there's a growing uptake, but for me, it's, I, so far I don't really have any real inside of, of how users are using in their production environment. Ceph users are a bit more conservative when it comes to updating the, to the latest versions. And I, I see there's a, a growing increase in the number of reports and feedback on the dashboard, but we are still in, in an early stage. So I don't really have that big war stories to share. But of course, I'm, I'm very happy to hear about people using it and what they like about it, what they dislike about it, what they're missing. This, at this point, is still an incarnation or what we think would be the right things to do and to visualize. And we are a small team. Yes, we are, of course, have influence by the product management team of the companies behind it, so they have their ideas. But this is an upstream community project, and the users are the ones that should tell us what they would like to see and, and what they like or what they dislike. Um, we do get our fair share of bug reports, so there definitely is usage going on. But I, I personally would, get, would love to get more direct feedback on how is the usability, how is the user experience, how can we enhance this. Um, we are aware that the dashboard is pretty raw in, in certain levels. So um, if you take a look at some of the dialogues that we have, for example, creating a pool or something like that, that still is pretty much an adaption of the command line in the sense that you need to know all these values and parameters and you need to yeah, be familiar with what you're entering in here. So at some point where I would like to go to or get to is um, being more workflow oriented and basically starting from a task, not being too self-specific on, on how to reach that goal, but asking the user, what would you actually like to achieve? And, and then guiding him or her through those various steps. Okay. Yes, another question? All questions answered. Or question or comments? Out or of curiosity, who of you has actually looked and touched that dashboard? Okay, fair enough. Thank you, cool. That's good to hear. 
Well, feel free to grab me. I'll still be around until late in the afternoon today. I'm happy to have conversations about this. <laughs>